Trinity was organized and built to become the principal church of the Arkansas Episcopal Diocese. Constructing the church was largely the responsibility and achievement of its founding bishop, the Right Reverend Henry Miles Pierce. When Reverend Pierce was elected the fourth missionary bishop of Arkansas and the Indian Territory, what we now call Oklahoma, in 1870, he set out to establish a religious order in which was still a very undeveloped Arkansas even after the Civil War and Reconstruction. What a lot of folks don't realize is that so much of Arkansas was still considered a frontier state even 10 years after the Civil War began. Now, after nine years of service as a missionary bishop, Reverend Pierce recognized the need for a cathedral in Milwaukee and approached the people of Christ Episcopal Church about assuming cathedral responsibilities. And here's my first question, Michael. When you assume cathedral responsibilities, what does that entail? So it means it becomes that place and becomes the seat of the bishop's authority. Therefore, he draws the word he draws, which means chair or seat. And there's a seat there that is also the bishop's chair, the original chair of the seat. transepts were completed and the altar was moved to the north transept wall. 
due to, again, to a lack of funds, Reverend Pierce was unable to finalize construction on the chancel until 1892, when the altar was at last moved to its proper place at the east end of the building where I'm standing right now. It had taken Reverend Pierce 13 years to realize the fruits of his labor, but what fruits we are now experiencing. Okay? Memorials and gifts have been presented, presented throughout the years, the first being the brass altar crosses in member of the first acolyte, Halfred Dagan, who died in 1886 of typhoid fever. And again, I'm going to go to my resident partner in history, Michael. Uh, what, um, when we talk about the position of acolyte, you describe that for me? I was an acolyte. Chris was an acolyte. Acolytes are, well, in the 1880s, they were only boys, but boys who and now girls do this, but who assist the clergy in doing liturgical functions. Uh, if you're Roman Catholic, think of, think of the term altar boy, but it's, it's a little more than that because you may wind up carrying a torch across the banner, uh, looking across this room, I see several of you who were acolytes. So yeah, that, that tradition has been part of our life since, since this cathedral church was opened. And I can speak about acolytes. I don't train them. So. <laughs> okay. The window over the altar, however, is a memorial to Bishop Pierce, with whom not this church would not be here, and was dedicated on Easter Sunday, 1909. The carved eagle lectern right here, which is just an amazing piece of craftsmanship, was donated in 1918 in memory of Edmund Urquhart. Okay. A major addition to the church came in 1924 when, Pe when Reverend Peterson's daughter, Mrs. Elizabeth Lyman, gave the chapel right here to my right in her father's memory. The chapel is attached to the northwest and in northeast intersection of the transit and nave walls and it completed the embodiment of the structure of the, of the cathedral. The cathedral itself is the traditional cruciform plan with its transepts ascending to full nave height at the crossing. The nave is framed with wood beams trained, trimmed with bent pine planks that we will see throughout and molding to resemble the towering stone and carved wooden arches of, more, of larger, more costly cathedrals, which were primarily more common in Europe at that time. Um, solid wooden brackets over the side aisles at each column are extended to give the illusion of flying buttresses. The cathedral is dimly lit and all wood is darkly stained. Light streams down from above through six lancet clustering windows above the intersection of the side aisle and the nave. Above the chancel to the east and over the main entrance to the nave and from the west are large drop arched windows with round three wall transoids. The north and south transept windows also have drop arches but with intersecting tracery. Small lancet arched windows are located throughout the building. Small high windows are employed directly beneath the gables of the nave and transepts and in the centers of the three two exposed sides of the tower. Stained glass is used in all the windows to create colorful pictorial representation of both religious ideas and of past clergy in the Episcopal Church. Excuse me. The chancel altar, which has a large body carving of Christ, was given to the church in 1924. The original altar was removed and placed in the smaller chapel shortly after it was complete. The exterior is dark brown brick laid in common bond with brick buttress walls. The building is asymmetrical 
having an engaged spherical back fabricry at one side of the nave and a two-story engaged tower to the other. Dormers emerge from the nave roof at each clusterly window. Trinity Cathedral is in an excellent state of preservation, as you can well tell. And again, it's probably the best example of Vansal Gothic religious architecture in Arkansas. Now, outside of the cathedral building here itself, there are other additions. Parish House, directed in 1951, which was inspired by the long of the club of the school of our Cathedral House was completed in 1953. The line of annex, which was named for Bishop Pierce's daughter, Elizabeth Pierce Lyman, was added also in 1966. And finally, in 1981, Chancellor's Hall was erected and the parish house and cathedral house were extensively remodeled. Now, as I stated earlier, the cathedral was designed in a cruciform state. And as I described the features of the cathedral, again, you've got a guy who, who just got the first experience, the the wonders of this building just barely three weeks ago. So, th 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 I'm, I'm still going to have probably the, um, how do you put it, probably the look of a kid at a candy store. I mean, literally, because it's still just absolutely amazing. So, <sighs> from the narthex, the double door entrance where we came in, we're going to observe some points of interest. First off, the baptistry, the font that <coughs> right here um, coming in was given in 1902 by the, number, by the men of the young Sunday school class at Trinity. The only remaining stained glass window from the original stage of the cathedral's construction in 1884 is found in the laboratory in this direction off the baptistry. Then, the north nave to your right, which will be to my left, uh, are the north nave windows. The nave windows on the north and south sides of the building were manufactured in London. During the late 1960s and early 1970s, they were installed to replace earlier Victorian-style windows. Michael, do you, uh, was there any indication as to what became of those earlier windows? Um, he's talking about the windows in the nave. That the ones on they and if you look at them, they follow a medieval scheme of stained glass. The windows on the north side are depictions of the prophets who were told that the Christ was to come. The windows on the south side are the apostles who were sent to tell the world that the Christ had come. And if you look at those figures, they begin. They look like they're moving forward because Christ still comes in the breaking of bread and wine at this altar. So it's, it's the story of, of scripture, if you will, in stained glass. And the, the windows that were there, they are now in the, there was another scheme of windows that came in the 1890s, and those windows, well, are now in the church in Lake Village. Very good. Hey, now, Talking about the dwarf transept. The windows on the nave level contain depictions of clergy <laughs> associated with the Anglican church, as you will see in the windows on the side. Um, in the north transept, they include Bishop John Coleridge Patterson and William Porcher DeBose. Bishop Coleridge was a missionary to the people of Micronesia, and DeBose taught at the University of the South in Siwanee, Tennessee. The theme of the large stained glass window in the north transept is the Benedict Omnia Opera Domini. Did I pronounce that correctly? Good. My, my, my Latin's a little shaky. No, thank you. My, my Latin's a bit shaky. Well, it's defined as a hymn, psalm, or other song of praise taken from biblical or holy text other than the Psalms from the morning prayer. The window was made in England by artist George Beadle 
whose stained glass signature, the beetle, and I'm sure, Michael, would you point that out to us? If you look at the, the depiction of the Virgin Mary in the blue paint or blue veil, then the word Lord at the bottom of and that is the stained glass signature. And of course, a very unique signature as well. Okay? Waterfall under the large window, which dated from the 18th century, was given to Trinity from the Sunday school class of Trinity Episcopal Church in Pine Bluff. Now, the Pierce Chapel, which you get the tour once I, I get finished, is located east of the North Transept, and it is a memorial to Bishop Henry Miles Pierce. It may also be called, at times, the Angel Chapel, due to its stained glass windows, which are the finest in the cathedral. In order to pay for the nave windows in the chapel, Bishop Pierce's daughter sold a cold cream, kind of unique, a cold cream recipe called Angel Cream which was developed by her mother in the 1890s. Now this is truly entrepreneurship for a higher purpose, would you not agree? Okay? All right, now, the chancel. Talk about that for a minute. The first of the chancel's significant structures is the, again, the eagle lectern, which was used for scripture readings. It is referred to as the earthward eagle, and it was donated on the Feast of the Epiphany by the Edward Urquhart family in 1918. Uh, Mr. Urquhart was a native of Kingston, Ontario, who came to Little Rock in 1876 and established the Little Rock Wool Works and became one of the pioneers of the cottonseed oil industry in the state. I mean, I even remember a time in my life where it was not uncommon to drive by buildings that might have been in operation or might not have been, but there were ones thriving cottonseed oil operations. Prominent upon, again, entering the chapter of the cathedral is the presence of the high altar in the sanctuary, which is overlooked by a statue of Christ and the large stained glass window with quarter quadrifold. For those of you who are not familiar with quadrifoil, in fact, I wasn't familiar with it until about two weeks ago, uh, it is an ornamental design of four loaves or leaves as used in architectural tracery, which resembles a flower or, in some instances, a four-leaf clover. The window's theme is St. Augustine's City of God, and it was donated by the congregations of the Episcopal Diocese and was dedicated to Bishop Pierce's memory, and the quadrifoil above the window is in fact Bishop Pierce's Episcopal crest. The chancel window is the largest work that has been done by New York's Charles McGinn Company outside of the New York metropolitan area. So again, we have work that is right here in our hometown that compares or even rivals those uh, religious architecture in the Big Apple. Who would have thought it? Okay? So, the high altar and the statue of Christ are made of German oak and were carved by Anton Lane, who was a member of the famed woodcutting family, the Lane family, of Obermagal in Bavaria, in southern Germany. Now, above the choir stall, are, are again clustering, excuse me, clustering glass stained windows depicting angels playing various musical instruments. And um, the most prominent though, and may I add, most amazing instrument here is the organ. I haven't heard it play, but I'm sure it would just I don't mind saying is I'm absolutely certain would totally blow me away. Um, it's the largest pipe organ in the state, which has over 5,000 pipes. In fact, what, what is the exact number? It's right. 
right at 5,000 pipes. Okay. Okay. It's right at 5,000 pipes. Okay. It's made up of four manual keyboards and 82 ranks of pipes, including the trumpets right back here at the nave's rear. The lectern in front of the organ on this side, um, excuse me, was manufactured in Little Rock and given to the cathedral by Mrs. Margaret Wick in 1905 on the Feast of the Epiphany. Now, the cloister, we're talking about the cloister room, and it is to the left of the pulpit, my left, right? Okay. Um, okay. Um, where the acolytes, the choir, and the clergy assemble prior to the beginning of the service, as well as holding banners used in the procession. Adorning the south wall is a 1907 stained glass window from the chancel of St. Paul's Episcopal Church, which was once at Fourth and Victory. It's flanked by two 1895 lancet windows, which are tall, narrow, and with a pointed arch at the top. Now, the south transept on the nave level are the images of Philippine missionary Charles Henry Brent, World War II era Bishop, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple, who, as you can see, is holding a model of Canterbury Cathedral. And I'm turned around. Which direction? Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. And, uh, and Bishop Samuel, and I'm still, I still have a, this is a mouthful. Sheriff Sheps. Thank you who once served as missionary to China. And the fourth lancet window on the south wall depicts 16th century theologian Richard Booker, who once wrote the laws of ecclesiastical polity, which defines the Anglican via media, or middle road, which urges moderation in all of life's pursuits. The large window in the south transept has the theme Suffer the little children to come unto me, and was installed in 1939. A drawing of the window's creative scheme can be found over the credence table in the back. When exiting the south transept, excuse me, two windows on the nave level began the collection of the images of the um, witnesses of the saints. The first four depicted are St. Peter, St. Andrew, St. James the Great, and St. John. Now, the South Nave. Those windows show the apostles who spread the news that the Messiah had come and was a common Middle Ages era theme. Among the images depicted here are St. Thomas, St. James, St. Philip, and St. Matthew, among others. You will also notice that the eyes of the saints depict them as looking towards the chancel and the high altar. Now, part of the cathedral's original 1884 construction, um, the funds were raised a century later to reinforce the bell tower so it could support an additional bell weight of 4,500 pounds. The full octave eight bells were cashed in 1987 by London's Whitechapel Bell Foundry. An installation was completed the next year. The bells were dedicated at the 1988 Feast of Pentecost and have continued to contribute to the music ministry of this cathedral through the art of English change ringing, which is the art of ringing a set of two bells in a controlled manner to produce variations in their sounding order. The bell's peals are witnessed by St. Cilicia and St. Francis of Assisi, whose images are depicted in the two stained glass windows located in the bell tower. Finally, the narthex and clustery windows, or, the, or what is called, referred to as the architectural antechamber, porch, or distinct area at the western entrance of some early churches, <coughs> excuse me, is the small landing area just inside.
inside the exterior front doors where you enter and leads to the interior front doors. The lancet windows, which represent an abbreviated history of Anglicanism, depict St. Constantine, St. Augustine of Canterbury, and, quote, the window of Queen Elizabeth. Enhancing the natural light of the cathedral are the clustery windows, whose purpose is to admit light, fresh air, or both, which at the time that this cathedral was built, obviously you didn't have the conveniences of climate control, electricity, and the like. So that was kind of an essential feature. <clears throat> they could be seen on all sides above the nave transepts and the uh, chancel wall windows were installed in 1937 and represent various saints and symbols of the church. At the back, the narthex and the organ trumpets <laughs> is a large stained glass window filled with tree balls, which are a symbol of the Trinity. So I'm turning around. Okay. Above the glass casement is a quadrupole given in 1895 by the Women's Auxiliary, now known as the Episcopal Church Women. As the four leaves framework is a symbol for <coughs> the Alpha and the Omega, it's fitting that our tour begins and ends at this spot in the cathedral. Any questions or observations? <laughs> I'm sure you're going to have a lot. Can I make a continual little, little story about the clear story windows? The, the um, frame of those windows when the cathedral was first built were trapeway shaped, and then they were changed in the 1920s. And as Reva said, those, they came in 1937, and if I remember correctly, all of them, all of them, cost the princely sum of $736. <laughs> and what year? 1937. So, if, and they're amongst my favorites in this building, because if you think about life in America in 1937 and kind of what was going on in the world in 1937, it's the middle of the Great Depression, the rumblings of war in Europe, and what will ultimately be our own involvement in it. And this is a, this is a time when even people who have been used to money didn't have money. But people gave them money to put these grim outlet in this space in these beautiful windows. It's a wonderful testament to faith. It's a wonderful testament to there is more to life that we live, that our faith, our lives are based on something we give forward. And that's what I love about these windows. And certainly a, a testament to the dedication of people of faith to rise above what they can see and to trust in the things that are unseen. Absolutely. Reverend Keller, would you have anything, have anything to add? I'm going to lift you out here. Oh, that's fine. I'm, uh, uh, just a couple of uh, small points. One is that um, when Bishop Pierce had the vision for building this place, um, there was no money in the South that was still, still really uh, uh, just a generation after the Civil War. So he raised the money mostly in the North. And, uh, and so uh, one of the things I remind people at Trinity from time to time is that remember that, that when we're thinking, we're feeling sorry for ourselves and thinking that uh, people are always asking us to do things for other people. So remember this church was built for us by Yankees. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, that, uh, that, that really was generosity on the part of people, mm -hmm. uh, an act of reconciliation for the, the, the church had been divided through the war, people reaching back across that divide uh, afterwards. Uh, another thing, just on a small point on the, the air conditioning and all of that, that's of course added later. Um, if you look back at the old service records before air conditioning, summertime weddings were held at 10 o'clock at night oh my God. Uh, uh, so that the church uh, wouldn't be so high. <laughs> 
you, you talk about healing the divisions at that time, and what one thing that we tend to forget about the history of that period is that Little Rock literally sat on, for, for at least two years of the war, sat literally on the dividing line of Arkansas's division between Union and Confederate settlement, and was literally right in the crosshairs of that kind of ugly division. So it's fitting that this place becomes a symbol of the time of healing, just not just in Arkansas, but throughout the nation. Well, folks, I am absolutely Can I clarify something earlier when the question was asked to me? Um, what constitutes genetic being a cathedral? Well, this is your cathedral. This is your cathedral. From whatever religious tradition you come from or not, this is your cathedral. Cathedrals exist. Our nation's cathedral in Washington exists for all of the folks in America. This cathedral church in Arkansas exists for all of the people in Arkansas. So welcome to your cathedral, and please feel part of it. And I guess it has been used in movies. It has been used in some movies, yes. I believe the most recent was God's Not Dead Too. Yes, that's, yes. 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 As, 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 as another point where my wife just became fascinated with what was here, and again, was very kind of envious. Those of us who belong to the cathedral parish, we are the caretakers of Bishop Pierce's dream. And that dream was to be a place that would engage the, the public, would engage our church, certainly, but would engage the public. And this has been the scene and the setting for grand liturgical settings. Uh, it has been the scene of wonderful parish, parish memories for all of us. It has also been the scene of many things that are public. So this is your cathedral. Much like Washington Cathedral exists, in our nation's capital. You don't have to go there to have your cathedral. You can come here. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Folks, <laughs> well, on behalf of Trinity Episcopal and the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program, I would like to thank you for this wonderful turnout today. I know that Michael and Reverend Keller would be honored if you know, get a little closer look at this amazing cathedral and its various architectural features, and I know that they will entertain and try to answer any questions you might have. But I would also like to um, announce that our sandwiching in history tours and our walks through history tours that we hold throughout the state are now officially have been announced. Um, our assistant, Elizabeth, was handing out some of the first copies of our tour brochure. I hope you all have one. If you don't, Elizabeth will be glad to give you one. And um, our first tour will begin on the first Monday in January. We will be at the Huh? I mean, Friday. Sorry, Friday. No, <laughs> Monday. Um, we the first Friday in January at Pulaski Heights United Methodist Church. They will be leading off this sheet. And if you happen to make some of our um, walks through history tours throughout the state, we will be leading that one off on the second, um, excuse me, on the, on the second Saturday in March in historic downtown Jonesboro. So hope to see you for these and others throughout the state. And again, Thank you so much for coming. I know we appreciate it. And Michael and Reverend Keller and the staff at the cathedral do so as well. Thank you all.